Hello, America. My name is Dylan John, and you are listening to the Neo Fusionist Book Review. This is not your typical book review, as I make no claims to political or philosophical impartiality. This podcast uses the format of a book review to explore the premise of Neo Fusionism. Neo Fusionism is the merging of paleoconservatism with naturalism within the framework of the revitalization of the Republican Party. We will be exploring politics, philosophy, psychology, economics, and sociology through a wide variety of books published both recently and historically. Thank you for tuning in. All right, so this is the first episode in which I'm going to review a book. Uh, last episode, I just gave you some political and philosophical principles upon which um, Neo-Fusionism is, is based without getting into any of the books because I wanted to kind of just explain where I'm coming from uh, with regard to my, my perspective on the content that I'll be covering. So uh, without any further ado, we'll get into our first book of the podcast. And this is going to be Liberty and Tyranny by Mark Levin. Uh, Mark Levin's a pretty well-known uh, conservative pundit, uh, author, and uh, he has a radio show and he has a a show on conservative review, and I believe he was on Fox News, and uh, he's just a very well-known individual. This book is very popular, probably his, I believe, his most, his best-selling book that he's written. Uh, it was a number one New York Times bestseller for weeks, I believe. It sat at the top of the um, New York Times chart, 12 weeks, number one New York Times bestseller. Uh, so, and the subtitle for the book is A Conservative Manifesto. And uh, so it was published in 2009, very early in the Obama administration. And the reason that I chose this book uh, to be my first review is because it can kind of be considered, I believe, a, well, as it says, a conservative manifesto. And so it lays out the philosophies of the modern conservative movement uh, in a pretty concise, clear way and provides me with an opportunity to take uh, my perceptions of neo-fusionism and, and what that is and, and its relation to paleoconservatism and its relation to naturalism and, uh, and kind of contrast that with, I guess, boilerplate conservatism. Um, I wouldn't necessarily call this book neoconservative or paleoconservative, uh, just kind of standard conservative. If, you, if you're not uh, intellectually inclined uh, student of conservatism and you just consider yourself a conservative, um, this is probably pretty closely aligned with what you believe. So I'm going to, I agree with a good portion of the contents of this book. I should specify that up front. Uh, I agree with a lot of what he says, but I don't agree with everything that he says. And I'm more inclined to want to discuss the areas with which uh, I disagree so that I can make so, uh, sort of a contrast. I'm not going to go into detail uh, discussing every single portion of this book that I agree with. Um, I, I recommend it. You can get it and you can, you can get a real basic understanding of, of what conservatives believe and why. Uh, but I do want to make a few points about it. So the premise of his book is a contrast between the conservative and the statist. And while I can understand why he pairs those two as opposing um, groups of people, the, the conservatives on the one hand and the statists on the other, uh, there's, it's not a really pure contrast. Um, I would say that the statist is more clearly and distinctly contrasted with the uh, anarchist and the uh, conservative is probably more clearly contrasted with the, well, with the progressive. Although in some sense you could contrast the conservative with the radical, but I would say maybe that would be a contrast between the prudent and the radical. But conservative and, and progressive, that se seems to me to be a clear opposition. One, one looking to more looking to the past um, and conserving things which are, that which exists has, is, ha has value, and the conservative wishes to maintain that which exists. 
whereas the progressive is continually seeking to change into something new. Now that's a, that's a kind of a simplistic perspective. The the, cons the political conservative today is not necessarily interested always in preserving just what is. I mean, if you think about the reactionary strain in conservatism, it's like, say, we live in a post-New Deal era, and we have for decades. And so do we want, does the conservative want to necessarily maintain the big government that we've had over the past, you know, uh, 75 years? or more, the, the, the social order that exists today, that does the conservative necessarily want to just maintain that which exists currently? No, not really. The conservative tends to want to turn back the clock a little bit on a number of um, big government initiatives, and so that the, the conservative movement isn't so simplistic as to just say, well, you know, let, let's just keep what is and not not rock the boat. Let's not make any changes. That's not the mo that's not really the modern conservative so much. It's like, you know, picking a particular point in the past, maybe before the rise of the statist. Um, and so, in that regard, the statist and the conservative become opposed to each other. Uh, but it's contextual. You know, it's it's because we are living in a post-statist world where the statist um, influence is, is massive. So that's kind of why the conservative and statist become opposed to each other. Um, so uh, with that said, I just wanted that little caveat about the, about the contrast that he draws between the, between the uh, conservative and the statist. He talks a little bit about um, where the Republican is today, where the conservative is today, and what must be done. And so I'm going to read a little bit of this, and I'm going to kind of establish a, uh, a pattern here. I'll start with this book, but I'm going to read fairly significant sections of the books that I'm reviewing to you uh, because I want you to really get a feel for the tone and for the perspective of the author uh, so that I can then turn around and comment on those sections that I've read to you. Um, I'm only going to be doing, pr probably only going to be doing uh, nonfiction books, and so you don't have to expect me to like story time, you know, read reading to you, but just reading sections of their thoughts so that you can get a grasp on their perspective, um, and then commenting on that. So uh, we'll start right here with a section from I believe this is right from chapter one, or even from the prologue. Uh, yeah, this is from the prologue called the Conservative Manifesto. He lists out a bunch of different points that he he wants to lay claim as this is his particular vision of the of the conservative manifesto but before he does that and i'm not going to read all those points to you you can read them yourself it's more like policy points but before he does that he talks a little bit about where the conservative is where the republican is in modern society and uh and so i want to read a section out of that he says quote republicans seem clueless on how to slow contain and reverse the statist agenda they seem to fear returning to first principles, lest they be rejected by the electorate, and so prefer to tinker ineffectively and timidly on the edges. As such, are they not abandoning what they claim to support? If the bulk of the people reject the civil society for the statist utopia, preferring subjugation to citizenship, then the end is near anyway. But even in winning an election, governing without advancing first principles is a hollow victory indeed. Its imprudence is self-evident. This is not the way of the conservative, it is the way of the neo-statist, subservient to a reality created by the statist, rather than the reality of unalienable rights granted by the creator. So, what can be done? I do not pretend to have all the answers. Moreover, the act of writing a book places practical limits on what can be said at a given time. However, I do have some thoughts. The conservative must become more engaged in public matters. It is in his nature to live and let live, to attend to his family, to volunteer time with his church and synagogue, and to quietly assist a friend, a neighbor, or even a stranger. These are certainly admirable qualities that contribute to the overall health of the community, but it is no longer enough. The statist's counter-revolution has turned the instrumentalities of public affairs and public governance against the civil society. They can no longer be left to the devices of the statist, which is largely the case today. This will require a new generation of conservative activists, larger in number, shrewder, and more articulate than before, who seek to blunt the statist's counter-revolution, not imitate it, and gradually and steadily reverse course. 
More conservatives than before will need to seek elective and appointed office, fill the ranks of the administrative state, hold teaching positions in public schools and universities, and find positions in Hollywood and the media where they can make a difference in infinite ways. The statist does not have a birthright ownership to these institutions. The conservative must fight for them, mold them, and, where appropriate, eliminate them, where they are destructive to the preservation and improvement of the civil society. Parents and grandparents must take it upon themselves to teach their children and grandchildren to believe in and appreciate the principles of the American civil society and stress the import of preserving and improving the society. They will need to teach their offspring that the statist threatens their generation's liberty and prosperity and to resist ideologically alluring trends and fads. Parents and grandparents by the millions can counteract the statist's indoctrination of their children and grandchildren in government schools and by other statist institutions simply by conferring their knowledge, beliefs, and ideals on them over the dinner table, in the car, or at bedtime. If undertaken on an intimate, purposeful, and consistent basis, it will shape a generation of new conservatives. And education should not stop at the front door. We, the people, are a vast army of educators and communicators. When the occasion arises in conversations with neighbors, friends, co-workers, and others, take the time to explain conservative principles and their value to the individual, family, and society generally. The conservatives should acquire knowledge outside the statist universe. He should not ignore the media, Hollywood, government schools, and universities, but they should not be the primary sources of information that shape the conservatives' worldview. Technology has made easy access to an unprecedented wealth of resources that contribute to the conservatives' understanding, including the Avalon Project, which makes available online, among other things, a large collection of the nation's founding documents, the Atlas Economic Research Foundation, which offers sources of free market thinking, the Cato Institute, which produces scholarly materials oriented around Adam Smith's philosophy, and the Heritage Foundation, which produces scholarly materials oriented around Edmund Burke. Moreover, established publications such as Human Events and National Review engage in conservative thought relating to current news events. Talk Radio provides a dynamic forum for conservative thought and debate. There are academic institutions, particularly Hillsdale College and Chapman University, that provide formal educational opportunities. Groups such as Young America's Foundation, the Intercollegiate Studies Institute, and the Leadership Institute promote conservatism on college campuses throughout the nation. There are, in fact, many outstanding conservative organizations and institutions, too numerous to list, that are accessible to the public. The statist has also become masterful at controlling the public vocabulary. For instance, when challenged on global warming, he accuses the skeptic of being a denier, favoring corporate polluters, or being against saving the planet. Draconian measures that threaten liberty and prosperity, such as cap-and-trade, are marketed in appealing and benign slogans, such as going green. The statist never destroys, he reforms. He never disenfranchises, he empowers. End quote. So, I guess the point that, that I wanted to make and why I wanted to read that section is because there was a movement that started in the 60s that among Marxists in the United States and, and also in Europe, but I think this was a as a concept was primarily in the US, although it's been implemented all over the world, which was the long march through the institutions. And what happened over the course of several decades, starting in the 60s, probably even starting before that, but really like being named and, and made a, uh, a policy point of the Marxists and communists was a long, slow infiltration into the various institutions that guide uh, society in the West. So that now the schools, the public schools, the universities are almost entirely controlled by the left. Uh, the media, Hollywood, controlled by the left. Um, even uh, human resources departments and corporations is controlled by the left. Um, and so, you know, the, these are the these are the methods by which our thought is kind of guided and, and structured. You know, we are constantly bombarded by various forms of media. Th those of us that, you know, have a fairly limited media diet when it comes to, like, Hollywood, mainstream um, uh, uh, television programs and stuff, we still get it. And a lot of people, like, uh, absorb a lot of it. Um, and and it's, it affects their perspectives. Uh, and conservatives have been asleep at the wheel. 
you know, like he says, the, the left does not have a birthright ownership of these institutions. They diligently fought for them. They infiltrated them over the course of generations, and now they control them. And as they control these institutions, they control the minds of our children and of the next generation and of the average person. And we as conservatives need to begin to look at these institutions and begin to fight for them. To run for city council and board of education, to become teachers in the school system so that we can affect this perpetual, and I'm not saying that, well, we need to brainwash kids in the opposite direction, but we need to we need to put the brakes on the uh, left-wing programming that is occurring in the school system. And, you know, in this quote, of course, he talks about the uh, statist becoming masterful at controlling the public vocabulary. And that's totally true. The examples that he uses all relate to um, environmentalism, climate change, climate denier, being against saving the planet, etc. Um, I don't agree with his position on the environment. We'll talk about that a little bit more later. And also, when he talks something in the in the early er, first section I quoted, uh, which is that um, the way of the conservative is not uh, subservient to a reality created by the statist, but to the reality of unalienable rights granted by the creator. Um, I don't think that you know, a naturalist perspective uh, would endorse inalienable rights created by, by a supernatural creator. Um, and, you know, I don't want to use this opportunity to get into the, a discussion of what rights are, whether they're in, unalienable or, you know, where they come from, or do they even exist, or did, is it something that we invented? That's a topic for another show, but suffice to say, there are little bits and pieces here where I'm like, ah, you know what, I don't necessarily agree with that. But on the whole, um, the, the general conservative um, policy positions, I largely agree with. And I, and I, um, I agree with uh, Mark Levin's comments about what needs to be done in, in order to kind of take back control or at least an equitable influence in American society. Um, and so that's that. I'm going to move on now uh, to his section where he talks about faith. Uh, and he, he says, uh, quote, The question must be asked and answered. Is it possible for the conservative to be a secularist? There are conservatives who self-identify as secularists, whether or not they believe in God and take or take a religion. And it is not for others to deny them their personal beliefs. However, it must be observed that the declaration is at opposite with the secularist. Therefore, the conservative would be no less challenged than any other to make coherent that which is irreconcilable. Moreover, for the conservative, as it was for Burke and the founders, faith is not a threat to civil society, but rather vital to its survival. It encourages the individual to personally adhere to a dogma that promotes restraint, duty, and moral behavior, which not only benefit the individual, but the multitudes in society generally. As George Washington wrote in his farewell address, quote, of all the dispositions and habits which lead to political prosperity, religion and morality are indispensable results, and let us with caution indulge the supposition that morality can be maintained without religion, end quote. Attempts to stigmatize as religious zealots or marginalize as social extremists, those individuals who resist the statists' secular impositions, for they are the coercion behind America's moral and cultural decline, is to condemn conservatism, the founders, and the civil society. How can it be said, as it often is, that moral order is second to liberty when one cannot survive without the other? A people cannot remain free and civilized without moral purposes, constraints, and duties. What would be left but relativism, manifesting itself in anarchy, followed by tyranny and brute force? For the conservative, social issues relating to life and lifestyle, tested by human experience through the centuries, are not merely personal habits and beliefs, but also mer merit encouragement throughout the society." End quote. So, uh, he, and now I am making the case... Um, that our government needs to be completely secular. Uh, and that's not to say, you know, our society needs to be completely secular. Um, that's a totally different argument. 
uh, and this is this is part of the part of the problem that that we run into with people on the left and people on the right uh, is the is the lack of nuance and separation between culture and state. So, you know, if you're advocating for a secular government, or for an, an, an entirely secular government, uh, that doesn't mean that society needs to be entirely secular. It means that that government needs to be entirely secular. Um, and he talks. Uh, he says uh, about about liberty and virtue, and how can it be that moral order is second to liberty when one cannot survive without the other? People cannot remain free and civilized without moral purposes, constraints, and duties. Um, those moral constraints and duties and moral um, direction is not something that can be imposed in any way, shape, or form. And I'll talk about this more. Down the road, I'm going to get into another book uh, by Frank Meyer called In Defense of Freedom. And Frank Meyer was the guy who basically invented the concept of fusionism in the first place, which, which neo-fusionism is kind of built upon. Uh, but he talks about um, freedom and virtue and the potential conflict between them. And he really criticizes the perspective that Mark Levin seems to embrace here, which is that, um, you know, you can't just have freedom on its own by itself without constraints because it's just license. It's just going to lead to immoral behavior. You have to balance freedom with uh, virtue. And fine, maybe you do have to balance freedom with virtue, but what it's not a balance. It's that it's that the state will support freedom as its directive. The state embraces complete freedom. And any political activity needs to support perfect freedom, you know, uh, according to like a non-aggression principle. You don't have freedom to hurt other people, but you have freedom to do what you want as long as you don't hurt anyone else. That's, that's the state that should be supported by the, by the government, uh, the state of existence that should be supported by the government. Whereas our social institutions can step up and promote voluntary virtuous behavior but you can't dictate virtuous behavior through the state it's not virtuous if it's dictated it's just obedient um, and so you know he wants to Levin wants to infuse faith into conservatism and that's fine within his particular vision of conservatism I don't believe that there is a supernatural I don't think that science has in any way supported the concept of anything being a supernatural extra material force like God or or anything else. So no, I don't think that there is a, an external God outside of material reality. And uh, I don't want to see the notion that there is a supernatural reality put into the codified by the government. I don't want that. Um, I don't mind if there are churches or people who write books who promote the notion that there is a God and that there is a transcendent reality. Um, more power to you. That's your that's your vision for the world. You know, great. Write your books, make your podcasts, do your TV shows, have your church, whatever it is you feel like you need to do to promote your idea, but keep it out of the government. And so. Uh, my my vision for a conservative is, is is fairly well aligned with Frank Meyer's vision that that you need to preserve freedom, uh, complete and absolute freedom, first and foremost within your interactions with policy and uh, any any kind of striving toward virtue is something that occurs outside the bounds of the government. And you know when you start getting into questions of like gay marriage or, or what have you, abortion and, or whatever, there's a, there's a drive to use, um, uh, among many conservatives, there's a drive to use the government to enforce what is perceived to be moral behavior. That's not the vision of conservatism that I hold. And so that's not kind of the foundation that I'm trying to lay out in, in, in laying out the, the premise of neo-fusionism. It's going gonna, it's gonna to have to keep that sense of freedom and um, and the, the ability for people to live without religion um, without any kind of 
government imposition of, of the majority religious perspective. So, yes, that would be secularist. I mean, that's kind of how we define secularism, as uh, the government um, is completely non-religious. I don't care what the founding fathers believed. I don't care what they said. All I care about is what, I mean, I do care what they said. You know, I, I, I value their opinions. But at the end of the day, the laws that they created did not endorse religion in government. They, they, the laws that the founding fathers created were secularist. And they may have believed that, they, that we needed to have religion uh, in order for secularist government to be able to function correctly, but they didn't codify it into law because they recognized the value of freedom. And I can't wait to get into uh, that book I'm talking about, In Defense of Freedom, uh, by, Mar by um, Frank Meyer, that's going to talk more about that topic. So, so with that said, I'm going to move on to the next section I wanted to quote here. Um, and I'm not going to talk about this section very long. I have some other books that go into more detail about this particular topic, but this is international trade uh, in the section on the free market. Now, the free market is largely considered a core component of conservatism. Um, and I'm all in favor of the free market in domestic affairs. But in international trade, it's just not the same sort of scenario. And, uh, and so I'm going to read what he has to say here, and I'm going to give it some brief comments, and then I'm going to move on to... Uh, to the last section that I wanted to go maybe into a little bit more detail. So what he says here in this section about free trade, he says, quote, The statist frequently attempts to relieve himself of responsibility for his own deeds by invoking the mantra of outsourcing, that is, the hiring of workers and businesses abroad to undertake tasks that might conceivably be performed in the United States. In 2004, Democratic presidential candidate John Kerry railed against Benedict Arnold CEOs who send American jobs overseas. In 2008, Obama asserted that we have to stop providing tax breaks for companies that are shipping jobs overseas and give those tax breaks to companies that are investing here in the United States of America. The statist urges the view that millions of jobs are lost to such practices and complains about every call center that opens in India. He creates the impression that there are no benefits to American society to hiring foreign workers and is not above instigating ethnic animosity. However, the facts do not support the hyperbole. Jacob Funk Kierkegaard, a research associate at the Peterson Institute for International Economics, studied the official statistics for mass layoffs, 50 or more people, in the United States. He found about 1 million people out of a workforce of roughly 150 million were part of a mass layoff in 2004 and 2005. Only a small percentage of these layoffs were due to the exportation of jobs. Kierkegaard wrote, The combined employment effects of offshoring and offshore outsourcing represent just 4% of all separations from mass layoffs in the United States in 2004 and 2005. And what of the giant sucking sound of jobs moving to, say, Mexico as a result of the North American Free Trade Agreement, NAFTA, which essentially eliminated numerous trade barriers among Mexico, Canada, and the United States? Those job losses would have shown up in American unemployment statistics, yet once NAFTA took effect in 1994, unemployment generally declined. In 2007, before the recent economic downturn, the average unemployment rate was 4.7, below the prevailing rates in the 1970s, 1980s, and 1990s. The statist ignores the benefits of free trade because it undermines his agenda. When a computer company lowers costs by opening a call center in India, the price of the computer goes down, benefiting American consumers. Money is then freed up in the United States to spend more productively. As Indians become wealthier, they buy more goods and services from the United States. In the past several years, some of the fastest growth in American goods and services exports has been to India. And what of the benefits of foreign investment pouring into the United States or insourcing? According to the Commerce Department, foreign investment created 447,000 new jobs in the United States between 2003 and 2007. In 2007, 5.3 million Americans were employed by U.S. subsidiaries of foreign companies. These companies maintained a payroll of $364.2 billion for American workers. End quote. Okay, we've got a fairly decent unemployment rate right now. We actually have a pretty good unemployment rate under Donald Trump. And 
I, I can see how you can make an argument that says, all right, everybody was talking about all these jobs that were going to get outsourced as a result of NAFTA, as a result of these various international trade agreements. Um, and yet here we are, you know, uh, over two decades after NAFTA, and we've got a really good unemployment rate, and we've got a really strong economy. So, you know, what's the deal? I can understand that perspective, but you have to you have to think too about well, what, how many people are currently or or, or were particularly be, before we started kind of um, boosting the economy in the latest the latest uh, upsurge since the Trump election? How many people were working part time jobs that would prefer to be working full time jobs? Probably a fair number. I I know I was one of them. Okay, I was one of them. So yeah, I was not unemployed, but I also was working part time. And not only that, but how many people are working jobs that they're overqualified for? How many people are working in like, you know, Walmarts and retail centers and doing these menial tasks um, when they sh could or would prefer to do something like more constructive with a better salary? Manufacturing jobs have, tend to pay higher wages. You know, if... Uh, if manufacturing jobs were here in this country to the same degree that they used to be here, then that would drive up wages in general because there be more comp would be more competition for workers, and people would be drawn away from, say, these retail jobs and these you know basic food service jobs into manufacturing where they can earn a better income. So wages would get pushed up all across the board in these other industries, and in some cases we'd see this automation that, you know, oh, well, you're going to get the kiosk at McDonald's and all these people are going to be out of work from, from these kiosks opening up. I mean, so much of that stuff would be already automated because those people that are currently working there would instead be working in a factory and they would be making a living wage. They would be making a good amount of money instead of working these part-time crappy jobs that could be done by machines but are being done by people instead because wages are so low that it's still feasible to do it by a person. You know, there's a there's it's not just about that raw unemployment number. How many people have left the workforce? I mean, the the size of the workforce was has been shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. The workforce participation rate has been shrinking as people back out of the workforce. That's not that's keeping the unemployment number low, but it's not really like good. We want maximum workforce participation. You know, because if you're not working, then you're depending on somebody who is working in, invariably, whether it's your family members or taxpayer. Um, so, and I, and I, you know, I'm, I'm kind of doing this kind of once over on these, on these various topics, whether it's religion or, or outsourcing or Republican strategy or the next topic that I'm going to cover um, in, in my review here, which is going to be environmentalism in, uh, in my review of this particular book. This is kind of like a, like a brief run through. There are other books that I'm going to be covering in more detail that address each of these individual topics specifically. Um, and it's going to be an opportunity for me to get into more specific detail about these things. But let me go ahead and move right on at this point to his section um, where he talks about the environment and the environmental movement. He says, quote, uh, outer quote, I'm, this, this section has a couple of quotes within it. So I'm going to give an outer quote for the whole quoted section, and then I'll, I'll give inner quotes for the parts that he himself is quoting. So outer quote, on its website, the group Earth First declares that it, quote, does not accept a human-centered worldview of nature for people's sake, end quote. It insists that, quote, life exists for its own sake, that industrialized civilization and its philosophy are anti-Earth, anti-woman, and anti-liberty. To put it simply, the Earth must come first, end quote. Is not man therefore expendable? And if he is, is not the suppression of his liberty, the confiscation of his property, and the blunting of his progress at all times warranted where the purpose is to save the planet, or any part of it, from man himself? After all, it would seem that there can be no end to man's offenses against nature if he is not checked at every turn. National Park Service ecologist David M. Graber, writing in the Los Angeles Times in 1989, well articulated the perversity of this view. Quote, We contaminated the planet with atmospheric hydrocarbons and metals beginning in the Industrial Revolution. 
the atomic age wrote another indelible signature in radioisotopes on every bit of the Earth's surface. DDT and its kin appear even in the Antarctic ice. I, for one, cannot wish upon my children or the rest of Earth's biota a tame planet, a human-managed planet, be it monstrous or, however unlikely, benign. I am not interested in the utility of a particular species, or free-flowing river, or ecosystem to mankind. They have intrinsic value, more value to me than another human body, or a billion of them. Human happiness, and certainly human fecundity, are not as important as a wild and healthy planet. We have become a plague upon ourselves and upon the Earth. It is cosmically unlikely that the developed world will choose to end its orgy of fossil energy consumption and the third world its suicidal consumption of landscape. Until such time as Homo sapiens should decide to rejoin nature, some of us can only hope for the right virus to come along." End quote. If nature has intrinsic value, then nature exists for its own sake. Consequently, man is not to be preferred over any aspect of his natural surroundings. He is no better than any other organism, and much worse than most because of his destructive existence. And so it is that the enviro-statist abandons reason for a faith that preaches human regression and self-loathing. And he does so by claiming the moral high ground, saving man from himself and nature from man. Most individuals who are sympathetic to environmental causes are unwitting marks, responsive to the enviro-statist's manipulation of science, imagery, and language. Over time, they self-surrender liberty for authority, abundance for scarcity, and optimism for pessimism. Save the planet is the rallying cry that justifies nearly any intrusion by government into the life of the individual. The individual, after all, is expendable. Who would have thought that the flush toilet would become controversial? It is not only an everyday convenience, which would be enough, but critical to human health. No matter. In 1992, Congress passed the Energy Policy and Conservation Act outlawing the 3.5 gallon toilet and replacing it with the 1.6 gallon toilet. The purpose was to reduce the use of water. To this day, the mandated change requires users to flush the toilet more often, which hardly saves water. A government that is powerful enough to dictate the flow of water in a toilet is a very powerful government indeed. Some enviro-statists even advocate for dry toilets, which are basically dirt pits, especially for the undeveloped world. They claim flush toilets would be an environmental disaster if China and the Third World used more of them. Clearly, the world's poor are among the enviro-statists' most victimized populations. Today, almost 1.6 billion people use candles and kerosene lamps to light their homes, filling, filling them with smoke and soot and risking fire. In India, where 600 million people live without electricity, Greenpeace campaigned against the incandescent light bulb because it emits carbon dioxide, apparently forgetting the polluting effect of burning kerosene for light. The light bulb, they said, is a hazardous product to everyone, and they dubbed Philips Electronics, India's major light bulb producer, a climate criminal. In much of the world where the statist reigns, the nights remain dark. In 2002, Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld commented that, quote, if you look at a picture from the sky of the Korean Peninsula at night, South Korea is filled with lights and energy and vitality and a booming economy. North Korea is dark, end quote. Even in the United States, Congress banned incandescent bulbs by 2014, replacing them with the costlier compact fluorescent light bulbs, which contain highly toxic mercury. Those without power in India and parts of Asia also suffer through sweltering heat, sometimes over 100 degrees. In 2007, the New York Times wrung its hands because the world's atmospheric scientists are concerned that the air conditioning boom sweeping across Asia could lead to more serious problems with the ozone layer. The washing machine, which liberated mostly women from the arduous task of hand-washing clothes, is attacked for its consumption of energy and water in use with laundry detergent. Lawn mowers, chainsaws, leaf blowers, and barbecue grills are all environmental targets. But the technology most despised by the enviro-statist is the automobile because it provides the individual with a tangible means to exercise his independence through mobility. Starting with the Arab oil embargo of 1973, in which the Organization of the Petroleum Exporting Countries cut oil exports to the United States, for supporting Israel in the Yom Kippur War, the automobile has been relentlessly demonized as the en enemy of the environment 
end outer quote. Now, this section, there's more. I mean, this is only a part of his chapter on envirostatism. Uh, this just needs hardcore uh, opposition, I believe. This, this mentality is, is damaging to the conservative movement. I don't think it represents a, an honest uh, conservative mindset um, to, to essentially, I mean, we can go through this bit by bit, but in the very beginning, um, he quotes Earth First, uh, that, that does not accept a human-centered worldview of nature for people's sake. Um, and he opposes this perspective. Uh, and, and Earth First says, um, life exists for its own state, and um, industrialized civilization is anti-Earth, and the Earth must come first. And he opposes that perspective. And he says, is not therefore man expendable? Well, you know, newsflash, uh, man sort of is expendable. Um, this is, of course, the result of a religious worldview that places man at the top of creation. And, you know, it does not, he, he does not view man as steward, the steward of creation, that he's supposed to um, uh, uh, protect and, and guide and, and act as a beneficent manager or ruler of the natural world, which is, to my understanding, kind of the biblical explanation. But it's more along, his perspective follows more along the lines of what Heidegger criticizes uh, as view, mankind viewing nature as a standing reserve, as a, as a, a set of natural resources. I mean, even the word natural resources makes nature uh, defined by its utility to mankind, that it doesn't have any inherent value. It doesn't have value on its own. It only has value in so far as how we use it. Um, and and essentially, he, he makes this case that, uh, you know, if the, he says the, the blunting of his progress, meaning man's progress, the blunting of his progress at all times is warranted or, or you know, this is his, his paraphrasing of the environmental position is warranted where the purpose is to save the planet or any part of it for man himself. Well, I mean, if you want to get down to it, like if, if you're really talking about saving the planet, uh, yeah, maybe sometimes some sort of constraints upon humanity would be appropriate. Uh, we love our freedom. We, we, you know, I mean, I, I talk about freedom. I'll be talking more about freedom. Freedom is a critical component of human thriving. But that doesn't mean the f we have the freedom to destroy the planet, you know? I mean, no, you, there, there has to be a point where you say, no, uh, that's an externality, that, that the damage that you do to the environment and to the planet is, is an external um, result, byproduct, if you will, of economic activity that needs to be constrained because nobody's paying for it. Nobody's, that's what an externality is. It's a cost imposed on entities that are not part of the economic transaction. And that's what pollution is. It's an environmental externality where the costs are imposed on the natural environment. And uh, simple free markets do not address externalities adequately. It requires uh, collective stewardship to address an, an externality like that. And, you know, it's not just... He, he takes kind of a utilitarian approach where... Um, oh, let's see what he, he says. Uh, I mean, I, I find it hard to believe that he, that he opposes nature having intrinsic value. I mean, he says, if nature has intrinsic value, then nature exists for its own sake. Consequently, man is not to be preferred over any aspect of his natural surroundings. Now, that's kind of a, a, a rough interpretation there. Like, uh, you know, man as men prefer mankind. Humans prefer humanity over other creatures. And that's a natural, that's a natural outcome of, of our, of our intrinsic value system. You know, I, as an individual, prefer myself. Um, it's a kind of a self-centered, um, value system, which is the value system that, that has been crucial for our evolutionary development. Every creature, every creature on the earth prefers its own existence to the existence of others. 
doesn't sacrifice itself for others until religion came along, you know. Um, so, yeah, you, mankind can prefer themselves over their natural surrounding, but that does not automatically invalidate the inherent value of nature. Nature has intrinsic value and exists for its own sake. Yes, that does not mean that we have to sacrifice ourselves to nature. It just means that we have to live in, a, in accord with nature and not use it simply um, without regard for sustainability or, or without regard for the condition of our environment. Uh, and then, you know, when he talks about the toilets, you know, like his perspective is essentially like, how can you possibly go to something so simple as a toilet and impose government controls over how we use our toilets. You're all up in our business. Big government is all up in our business telling us how to use our toilets. Uh, you know, there's not an unlimited supply of water. As much as you're, you're kind of like dismissing the, the toilet as a simple thing, it, it uses water of which there is not an unlimited supply of fresh water in this world. There's a finite amount of fresh water and there's a finite amount of water we have access to and there's effort required to bring water to human civilization. Um, and so, you know, again, that's an externality where you can flush the toilet 10 times and, you know, every morning and everyone could do that and, like, we could just, dr we could just drain the water and where's the where's the penalty? So what the water prices are going to go up, and then you're going to make it so that you know well wealthy people can flush the toilet as much as they want, and poor people are going to have to you know not have have as little water as humanly possible. Um, I personally I don't see a problem. This is this is one area. This is like the area really the primary area where I don't have a problem with government uh, regulations. If there's a limited amount of water in the world, then for us to have a thriving society, we need to make sure that that water is not used frivolously. And having some sort of government imposition on our water use, I'm, I'm, I'm okay with it. I'm okay with it. And, you know, and just to make his argument even more stupid, he talks about a 3.5 gallon toilet was outlawed and replaced with a 1.6 gallon toilet. And he says, now uh, the toilet's so small we have to flush more often. Um, so, I mean, I guess if you drop a big log and you and you have to flush twice to get it down the toilet because of the, th the 1.6 gallon toilet isn't enough and you need the old 3.5 gallon toilet to get that down the drain. Well, even if you flush twice, you've still used less than a single flush of a 3.5 gallon toilet. So, you know, presumably most of the time that you use the toilet don't does not require you to flush twice. But even if you did flush twice every single time that you use the toilet because that 1.6 gallon toilet was not capable of clearing itself, you're still using less. 1.6 times 2 is 3.2. You're getting rid of a 3.5. So even if you flush twice every time, you're using less water than you used to use when you flush once every time with the 3.5. So his math is kind of, you know, I mean, not really solid. Um, but then, and lastly, when he talks about the automobile, he says, the technology most despised by the enviro-statist is the automobile because it provides the individual with a tangible means to exercise his independence through mobility. This is where, this is where the core of the problem lies. The automobile is not an opponent of the environmentalist because it provides people with individual mobility. It is a direct environmental impact of the use of the automobile that is the concern of the environmentalist. It is not an attempt to limit people's individual mobility. And this is kind of kind of flows through his perspective here is that, well, the, the statist ultimately wants, you know, he creates this nefarious figure of the statist that ultimately wants to destroy human individuality in its entirety and destroy all of our capacity for making independent decisions 
to make us completely subservient to the power of the state. And because he has created this nefarious figure, anything that advances the power of a regulatory state must therefore be a nefarious plot at the hands of the statist. Now, I'm not going to say that there are not people who want to see government controlling more of our lives because, A, they think that government is going to be more capable than, than individuals. I don't think it's nefarious. I think it's misguided. They think that government is going to just um, always know the right thing to do, and so therefore the more of our lives we hand over to government control, the better off we'll be because government is like a, like a parent figure that's going to going to guide its wayward children, I think that's a mistaken view. But you can't just apply that to everything and say that this, this whole environmental concern um, concept, because it is a problem that is large in, in scope, because it's ultimately like a global problem and environmental degradation and degradation of the, of the atmosphere and global warming is a global problem and because it's a na it's a problem that that can best be addressed at the national level um, as opposed to like the state or community level when you've got rivers that run through you know a, a multitude of states this is the sort of thing that is most effectively by the nature of the problem is most effectively dealt with at a larger scale than a than a smaller scale it is not it is it can partly be affected by the individual and the individual's personal um, spending habits and personal recycling habits, et cetera, et cetera. The individual has a role to play, but there is also a role to play with this particular issue because of the nature of the issue, because of the nature of the, of the, of the causes of the problem and the nature of the results of the problem that tends to be dealt with more effectively at a larger scale Therefore, it must be a plot. It must be a conspiracy. You know, and like, okay, so the scientists across the world are all in on a conspiracy to clean up the environment in order to expand the size of the government and prevent people from driving around because that would give them too much individual freedom. Get real. At some point, you have to look at this and say, get real. If you want to be taken seriously and you want to be a, a intellectual conservative that uses his or her mind clearly and is taken seriously by other people, you have to be able to make arguments that do not rely on massive, improbable conspiracy theories. Okay, the universities across the world. Now, are, are there, are there, um, I hesitate to use the word nefarious, but let's say, d are there destructive ideologies that thrive in the universities? Yeah, there are. Communism, Marxism, leftism, uh, the cultural Marxism, these, these concepts are divisive and they thrive in the universities and they're often perpetuated by well-meaning people, but they're ultimately destructive, okay? Those are in departments, like the humanities departments, that don't base anything they do on any sort of actual scientific research. It's all theory, and it's a complete misapplication of the word theory, by the way, but it's all these postulates of how society works and why, you know, barely, barely connected to psychology, but psychology is a science. These humanities departments and these gender studies departments and these um, these various political activists in the college campuses, they're not scientists. They're, they're spouting what they read in a book and what makes them feel good and what, what makes their supervisors happy. They're leftist supervisors. Now, so does that kind of fit the, the scheme of a conspiracy? Well, I guess, kind of, it's really just a bad idea that has propagated deliberately 
but to turn to the to this natural sciences which are not based on whimsy but are based on research and assume that that the climate scientists of the world the the you know the this the greater scientific community is pulling this fast one on all of us trying to convince everybody that there's some sort of environmental impact of the crap that we continually spew into the environment when in reality there's there's no negative impact at all to all of this pollution and smog and carbon dioxide or, or, or what have you that we pump and all the plastics that we keep pumping into the ocean and the just you know just massive amounts of of pollution and environmental degradation there's no negative impact to that at all it's all a big lie but if there was a negative impact to it it wouldn't really matter because nature does not have its own inherent right to exist outside of the use that we get out of it so like you're putting forward to number one you're putting forward the idea that it's all a big lie and number two you're putting forward the idea that well it doesn't really matter if it's a lie or not because the whole notion of nature having inherent value is bogus. So I strongly oppose this particular aspect of his book and of the conservative mindset in general. I don't think it is a concern. When you think about what it means to be conservative, conserving the natural world, maintaining our relationship with the world as it is as if you're religious then then how we interact with the world as god created it if you're not religious you know then then how we interact with the the world that billions of years of evolutionary and geological processes have created that we're going to turn around in a few generations and tr completely trash it is that conservative is that prudent is that sustainable is that respectful of tradition the traditions that go back not just you know the traditions that we've had for the past couple generations of consumerist traditions but the long-term traditions that we've had over the course of thousands of years in which we had a symbiotic relationship with the world at large this is not conservative it's it's like let's come up with a new idea for how we're going to interact with the world that is completely exploitative and let's export this exploitative mindset from the west into the entire world to bring everybody on board with western consumerism regardless of their traditions regardless of their culture let their culture get steamrolled by a giant wave of flush toilets and air conditioners and they can live their lives as if they are westerners and everything is going to be good because technology marches on that's not progressive I mean, I'm sorry, that's not conservative by my definition of the word. And so um, that's part of why I'm pushing the idea of neo-fusionism because I want to rebuild a new vision of what it means to be conservative, to, to have a new and not have, I don't want to have to fight over the term conservative. Let those other people who believe these other things that are written in this book, the, let them claim the mantle of conservative. I want to make something new. I want to call it neo-fusionism. I've talked a little bit in my last episode about what neo-fusionism is and why. But yeah, the paleo-conservative perspective and the naturalist perspective are, na are a natural fit for one another to create a perspective on why we value conservative uh, perspectives from an evolutionary outlook. Um, so so there's, my, there's my rant for the day. Now, um, I'm going to wrap this up, but I do want to mention that I have a uh, have just set up a Patreon page. If you support the ideas of neofusionism, if you think that the book review is a good process for me to kind of get out there and and, and share some ideas about what I think for you know what what I envision for a new branch of conservatism. If if you think this is valuable, worthwhile, and um, valid. I encourage you to go to the Patreon page and donate as much or as little as you're capable to help me get the materials that I need to help me um, promote the podcast as much as I can to as many people as I can. 
and I want to try to make a movement out of this. I'm just one guy, but I want to try to make a movement out of this, but I need your help. So if you like it, go to Patreon, uh, drop me a dime, and help me make this happen. I also have a Facebook page, and I have a Twitter account, and you can find all these things by searching for Neo Fusionist um, book review, and it should bring you right to where you need to be, um, or, or just the Neo Fusionist, I believe, is the Twitter account. So, so yeah, um, you know, leave me a review or go to the Facebook page and engage in some conversation and we'll see if we can iron this out, look at what other books we could potentially be reviewing and, uh, and let's go from there. Thank you so much for listening to the Neo Fusionist book review. My name is Dylan John and I wholeheartedly appreciate your support and your attention. Thanks a lot and I'll see you next time.